So whenever you're ready, Laura. All right. Well, welcome to Gardening with Disabilities. My name is Laura Ackerman. I am the Disability Services Coordinator for Ohio Agribility and for OSU Extension. I'm based out of Columbus and uh, since it's June of 2020, I'm working from home. So here we go. Maybe. Yep. So uh, to give you a little background on Ohio Agribility, we're part of a national network of state and regional agribility projects. There are 21 across the country. Funding is based on the U.S. Farm Bill and it's competitively awarded on four-year cycles. We are in the fourth of our third grant cycle, so this is our just starting our fourth year. And funds are awarded to a state team, which is comprised of the land grant university and a nonprofit organization. So in Ohio, that is the Ohio State University and Easter Seals of Greater Cincinnati. Some of our one of our missions is to promote success in agriculture for Ohio's farmers and farm families who are coping with disability or long term health condition. I do always have to point out that Ohio agribility cannot purchase equipment land. Uh, pay your rent or provide farmers with financial support. And I'm going to give you a little description here of what we got going on. Um, so the picture on the very on my very far left is one of our farmers. His name is Jeff. He is using what's called a standing. It's a, a action track chair. Is the variety of wheelchair it is. If you depending on how big your picture is, it looks like he's standing and he has it kind of looks like a backpack that's camouflage or like a spider that's attached to him it's actually a wheelchair that allows him to sit as you would in a wheelchair or to stand up and he's using it to stand up and work on his tractor because he cannot stand without the wheelchair uh, the next picture over are a bill and harold and harold's dog sadie they are two of our farmers and that is at a meeting that we had a few summers ago next picture over is a big group picture from 2016, that's uh, several of our farmers and their family members. They were gracious enough to meet us out at Indian Lake and it had to have been at least 150 degrees that day, as I recall, and they were still smiling. So I especially appreciate that. And then our very last picture on my far right is of Jeff and you can just barely see my colleague Charlie standing to his Jeff's right at the left of the picture. Uh, Jeff's also seated in a wheelchair and they're in front of a red tractor. And just so you know, I always describe, I'm a disability services professional, so I will frequently be presenting to audiences where someone in the audience may have a visual disability or a hearing or another type of disability. So in order to make sure that everyone can access and, and knows what's happening, I read everything and I describe all the pictures. And I also feel like sometimes when I'm in a non-agricultural audience, some of these pictures need a little bit of description because they can be um, something you're not quite sure of. So Ohio Agribility, we also provide education and resources to farmers, agricultural businesses and groups, healthcare, education, and disability professionals, and anyone who's interested in making farming safe and accessible. So like today, I may or may not have some farmers out in my audience. Uh, I bet I have some gardeners and hopefully some people that are just interested in learning about this topic. So in my pictures here on my far left, I have a ewe and her lamb. They're laying on a bit of straw and it looks like a wood barn. In the center, I have a very pretty red barn and it says Ohio Bicentennial is painted on the side of it. And on my far right, we have a group of chickens who are walking out of a barn. So I don't have a lot of audience feedback right now, so I'm gonna answer my own question. I'm asking what is relaxing and enjoyable about gardening? Whenever I have a big live audience with this, I hear that it's creative, you're growing your own food, it's therapeutic, it's great to get outdoors, it's a stress reliever, it's, it's all these great things. So I also at this point usually ask the question, does anybody in my audience make a living off of their garden? And after four years of doing this and probably at least a few several thousand people, I've had one single person told me that they made their living off of a garden. And the reason I ask that is because as we get older, there are some things that are harder for us to do, some things that we need to change. I know we like to go with, oh, we've always done it like that. Sometimes there's a need to change. And if you're not making your living off your garden, I'd like to encourage you to think, to be open to change. 
and even if you are making your living off of your garden, if there's things that need to be updated, whether the way you do a task, how you plant, where you plant, but I just want to remind people that I hope it never comes down to it for you be cut between I'm going to keep doing it the way I went, I am gardening or I can't do it at all that you would choose to just update it a little bit. That's my goal. So I have a couple pictures here. One on the left is a very pretty basket full of vegetables. We've got some lettuce, eggplant, maybe that's some mm, parsley or cilantro, some purple cabbage, radishes and a yellow pepper. And then the picture on the right is a, is a stump and it has a very pretty tablecloth that's got, looks like violets on it. And then it's got a little bowl of olives or grapes with a lavender pitcher and looks like a white a white uh, coffee cup. I would love to claim that as my own home. It's not, my house is not that fancy. So to start off with, let's talk about taking care of yourself. So before you go out and you start gardening, so I'll use today as an example. Yesterday was gorgeous here in the Columbus area, 70 degrees. I sat on the patio and worked, it was fab. Today around noon, we had a pretty big thunderstorm that made me worry about my electricity. Fortunately, right now, it's just fine, knock on wood. Um, but there's times in the summer, it's gonna be really, really, really hot some days, I think this weekend even. So when you're thinking about working in the garden, we wanna consider medication interactions or sensitivity. So there might be a medication or it could be a condition. You might have a, a condition or you know, disorder or something that can increase your sensitivity to heat, sun, cold, dehydration, you get fatigued easier, you have decreased pain recognition or neuropathy, which can come with diabetes. So be aware of all of those things before you start to go out and garden and factor those in when you think about how long can I work? Can I stand the whole time? Do I need to sit during some of this? What shoes am I wearing to make sure I'm not walking on something that's gonna puncture my foot and cause me a lot of trouble if I don't notice that? We also always encourage you to drink plenty of water, no matter what, what temperature it is. Like I said, it's pretty pleasant today, but it's gonna be really hot this weekend. Make sure you're drinking enough water to not dehydrate. And some of your medications might cause you to use the restroom more, which would make you more likely to dehydrate. So when we think about, do you need to change the way you work? Please take a break. If you're working and you're tired, take a break. There's no, benefit or it, you're not a stronger person because you can push through. Um, if you're tired, take a break. If your back hurts, sit down. If your feet or legs hurt, sit down. If it hurts to keep your hands up over your head, put them down. Because when I was a lot younger, I would be foolish and push through the pain and it didn't matter. It takes me a lot longer, personally, a lot longer to recover now. And I think that's true of a lot of us. Um, Repetitive tasks can lead to injury. So if you are constantly pruning something, doing some hand pruning or hoeing or weeding or whatever it is, if you start to get a little fatigued in those arms or whatever part you're using, stop and switch to something else. Doing a constant pruning or even holding your hose. I have a um, hoses and I have one sprayer attachment now that I can just flip it and lock it open and it stays open. So it keeps watering. I don't have to, I have some of the spray guns that I really like. I have a new one that I really love that I can flip a little switch and it holds it open. So I'm not gripping it to keep the water going. Cause the other night it took me maybe 30 or 40 minutes to water. And I don't have a very big flower bed, but it took a while cause it had been pretty dry and I was trying to be thorough, but holding that for 40 minutes, even if I switched hands, that would really wear my hand out. And I can tell you that it would, my hands would be feeling that a few days later. Be careful about your posture because it can lead to pain, fatigue, strains. If you twist yourself really hard or you less, rest all your weight on one hip or one leg, just be conscious of that. Straighten up, move around, and respect the pain. Pain is a way of your body telling you to please stop doing something. Switch what you're doing or just stop it altogether um, because it can, it can hold up on you. So I have a little picture here of a guy and he's standing up and he's holding a hoe and he's got a, a very, he's got a grimace on his face and he's got his hand on his low back and little squiggles that says his, his back is in pain. So please don't be that little guy that overdoes it and hurts your back. So gardening is exercise. You wanna stretch before, during and after you work in the garden. Um, Christy will send out some, some handouts later, but I have a link on our website and at the end of the, at the, end of this presentation, I'll have a 
an address, but I have some different handouts with garden stretches and some garden tools that I recommend and um, kind of an outline of this whole presentation. So you'll be able to get those off our website. And I have a picture of a kitty taking a really good stretch and getting a yawn out of it too. Not one of my kitties, but it looks quite a bit like one of mine. So I'm part of the Agricultural Safety and Health Program at Ohio State. That's part of my team. I'm in that team. So I always have to start with safety tips. We want you to talk, talk about preventing slips, trips, and falls. So that could be going up and down the stairs. At this, this point, when I have a live presentation, I always get at least a few horror stories about someone or someone's neighbor who was just walking down the two or three steps that come off the deck they slipped and broke a hip or a leg or just fell and could not get back up and spent hours laying on the ground because of course their cell phone was sitting up on the deck. So just be careful, whenever you're walking around, if you're coming down steps or climbing on or off equipment, have a minimum of one hand on the, on the deck rail, on the stair rail, on the piece of equipment that you're climbing on and off of. Don't try to climb, in, climb onto your lawn tractor with your hands full. Put at least one hand on it. Um, and I'm gonna digress over and talk about the picture that I have. So I have a picture and I mentioned those handouts before. On the AgriBuildy website, there is a um, handout, I think it's called Garden Tools Resources, something like that. But it's a two pager, side, front and back pages, front and back. And it has a lot of photos on it and it will list a lot of different tools or pieces of equipment. I want to say right now that Ohio State and AgriBility and I get nothing for those. I'm not endorsing those. I'm not promoting those. I just know that when I'm at a presentation and I want to listen, if they're talking about a product or a website or something, if I don't write it down or have some way to, to refer back to it, I'm going to forget. I'm going to be home and a couple days later not remember. So that handout is for that. Again, I get absolutely nothing for listing them on there and I don't promote or endorse those items. However, I like to use them as examples. So one of the pictures I have on here, it's called a Dawn Bar. So what you're looking at, it's a very close up view of a lawn tractor. It shows a yellow seat with black armrests and then it has a green foot um, footrest, like where your feet would go. And, and then that's over the yellow mower blade cover there's a black bar that's coming up out of that green footrest or I guess footwell, whatever you'd call that. It's a, the black bar is attached. So it would be up near the front. So maybe where your gas or your brake pedal will be, or perhaps a little higher. It, the bar comes up and then it starts to curve towards the person. So if you're sitting in the chair, it would come up and curve towards you. And then at the very top, the handle of it would go off um, vertically to a right angle. So it looks like the top of a cane really. And what that Dawn bar is for is let's say you're getting on that and those, those mower covers, get, mower blades can have a pretty broad, um, a pretty broad step to get up there because the blades are big. So instead of trying to grab onto the armrest, which is pretty short, you can grab that Dawn bar on your right or left hand, probably your right hand based on where this is, but that would be what, whatever your dominant hand is. Grab that and use that as support as you're climbing up onto the, onto the tractor. When you're seated, um, you don't necessarily need it, but when you're going to get up, you can also grab onto the Dawn bar with one or both hands and use it to leverage yourself up. Um, my dad had his knees replaced probably 15, 25 years ago, and he had trouble. He couldn't bend them enough and then heft himself up, lift himself up from a seated position after several years. So he'd have us pull up, but if he had something like that Dawn bar, it's very stable. So he could grab onto it and either pull himself up or just use it as leverage to stand. So that's a nice one. And then when you're getting off, you don't want to, you want to have your hand on that Dawn bar and or the armrest to step back off. You don't want to just hop off of it like we used to do when we were teenagers. That's not very safe. So that is the advantage of having some kind of a handle or support that you can lift yourself on and off the tractor with. Um, another safety tip is to protect your hearing. If you're going to go and mowing or doing anything where it's, you're using some sort of a machinery, please put on some headphones, earphones, ear protection. Um, there was a, my supervisor and coworker did a, did a webinar on, earring, on hearing protection. And she, one of the slides was she had a picture 
of a tractor that had a piece of equipment attached to it. And then there was behind that, there was maybe a grain silo. And then there was some other piece of equipment. And she said, how many different noise sources? And I picked maybe four, but there were really seven or eight because every one of those pieces of equipment, the grain silo, et cetera, the truck that was pulling the equipment or the tractor, they were all making a sound. And so one truck on its own might not be that loud, but when you add in five or six more pieces of equipment, it, it gets louder. So it doesn't take a huge booming rock concert or really loud vehicle to damage your hearing, even a lower level. So put on some headphones, protect your hearing, and label everything, oops, label everything you use in and on the garden, pesticides, chemicals, fertilizers, additives. If you're not leaving them in their original packaging, if you're gonna put it into a jar or a bottle or a bucket or a whatever, please label and date it because you may or may not remember what that was. You may have someone helping you in the garden and they could pick up a pesticide thinking it's a fertilizer and then fertilizer and you're just gonna have a disaster or you're gonna hurt somebody. Um, and then use personal protective equipment. A few months ago, most of us may not have known what PP is, PPE is, and I think we all know just what it is now. So depending on what you're doing, use a mask, use safety goggles, use hand protection. Um, if you needed to use a smock or some kind of clothing to protect yourself or your clothing. So that is one thing that this whole COVID pandemic has taught us what PPE is, so we can thank it for that. Um, next, I'm going to talk briefly about Fitness for Farm Life. It is a training program focused on developing education and skills. The topics that we, it focused on were prevention of injury, exercises, medicine, and stretching. Train the Trainer program is available summer of 2020. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the OSU staff are not available. So this was actually developed by Dr. Leah Schwen. She's an occupational therapist and Andrew Kramer who just completed his master's in public health. It is also on the AgriBuildy website. If you go in and look under resources, there's um, I think, I believe the videos for three webinars that we did plus some resources are on that. So I wanna talk about safe lifting. I've got a picture, here's Andrew. He's one of the co-authors of Fitness for Farm Life. Um, you may not be like Andrew here. I have two pictures on the far, on, the, on my left. He is taking, he's got a wheelbarrow full of straw that probably is dirty because we did get that, at a, take these pictures at a farm. Um, he's crouched over it, his back is hunched up and he's leaning down and he's doing it all wrong. On the picture on the right it says no. On the picture on the, Right, it says yes, he's crouching, he's um, crouching with his knees, his back is straight, he's looking forward. That's the correct way to haul it. And you may think, I'm not gonna be hauling around a wheelbarrow full of dirty straw, probably not, but you may be hauling a wheelbarrow or wagon full of mulch or um, flats of plants or equipment or tools or you know, soil, something. So we we do frequently find ourselves hauling things around and there's a right and a wrong way to do it. Boy, my computer is jumpy today. So um, there we go. So safe lifting. This is actually my colleague, Justin. We, when we're on campus, we share an office. He is showing the correct way to lift. So you'd start with your feet shoulder width apart and bend with your knees. We always hear lift with your legs, not with your back, but what does that really even mean? So it means bend down with your knees and get crouched down as close to the object you're lifting as you can. I will say right now that my knees do not like to crouch that low, so I may not be able to get as good as Justin, but don't just lean down with, lean down with no knees bent to lift it. You could very well hurt your back, but you wanna bend with your knees and you wanna put the effort into your legs, not your back. So use your legs, they're very strong muscles, to stand up and lift that thing and keep your head shoulder, keep your head up and look ahead. Don't look down at what you're lifting because even putting my head down like that, I can feel a little strain in my neck just from looking down. So keep looking ahead, you're crouched down and engage your stomach muscles, which will help you to use to keep your back stable and it might make it less likely that you could pull your back while you're lifting. You also wanna breathe out, which makes your stomach muscles engage more. Lift your object and hold it close to the body. Don't hold it out in front of you. Don't try to hold it over on one arm. Hold it close to your body because the closer you're holding it, the more you're using your whole body and not just your arms and forearms and shoulders. Your nose and toes should always stay in line. 
So set it down in front of you, don't twist it and toss it. So when I'm in person, I will actually demonstrate this by saying, I could just be standing and picking up a very lightweight tool. And if I twist my body to the right to put it down, I feel it in my back. And I'm just picking up maybe a little hand shovel, a little hand trowel. If I'm picking up something like that bale of straw Justin has, or a 25 pound, pound bag of, of potting soil or something, don't just twist your head, your nose and your toes. So if you're gonna start straight ahead and then you're gonna turn to your left, turn your whole body, not just twist at the waist. Your back will thank you. So we want you to protect your back. Remember the safe lifting techniques we just talked about? Make more trips with smaller loads. So instead of trying to layer everything onto yourself, and I am a former waitress, I can carry some stuff. And it was always full hands in, full hands out. And I still do that sometimes here. How many more things can I pack onto myself to avoid having to go up one or two flights of stairs more than once? Carry smaller things. Minimize carrying heavy or awkward objects. And when you can, put them in a cart or a wagon or whatever device you have, whether it's a wheelbarrow, a dolly, hand truck, anything. Use a seat cushion on your equipment. Don't minimize the thought of if you're spending a couple of hours on your lawn tractor, unless you've got a super cushion seat, you're gonna get jostled and shook and vibrated that whole time. And that can add, that can make some pain. It can um, cause you maybe some more fatigue, but put a cushion on something, especially if you've got a really hard seat and stretch. Again, it's always good to stretch, whether it's just neck rolls, um, shoulder shrugs. And I'm gonna put another pitch for Fitness for Farm Life. If you go on to our AgriBuilding website, go into the Fitness for Farm Life page, we have a webinar where um, Andrew talks you through nine or, I think we had nine stretches on there that he demonstrated. And we, we recruited different family members. My husband does a couple of the stretches. Leah's dad. So we all kind of recruited different people to demonstrate the stretches and they're pretty simple ones and they can be modified for your ability, but it is important to stretch. Keeps you from injuring yourself or li limits the, the possibility of injuring. Doesn't keep you from it. So I had mentioned hauling equipment and supplies. Use carts and wheelbarrows to haul heavy tools, supplies, and plants. Or even if it's not very heavy, but just cumbersome. It can be Maybe not that heavy, but a lot of little objects can be very awkward to carry and hard to juggle. Um, tips for choosing the right cart or wheelbarrow, get two or more wheels. I have a picture on this slide. It's of an old wheelbarrow that has no wheels at all. But if it had a wheel, it would be the wheel in front. So I've got a red wheelbarrow. It has um, the paint's kind of chipped. It's full of soil and it has some very pretty yellow plants growing out of it and that almost looks like lavender in the back of it, but it's a planter now. It has two, two handles coming up and then right in front of those handles at the back of the wheelbarrow, closest to where the person using it would be, there are two legs that come down and they're kind of like a rounded triangle shape. And then it goes up into the front and that's where the wheel would be. That looks other than the wheelbarrow I grew up using was yellow. That's just like ours. It had one front wheel and it was not very stable. So two or more wheels give you a lot more stability. Um, you want to think of the weight of the cart or wagon and the cargo that you're going to carry and how much is that all going to weigh. So look for carts or wheelbarrows with removable front or back panels and look for large tires. So on here I've got compare garden carts. I have two different carts. On my left side, I have a gray one. It's a nice looking wagon. It um, has a, a bottom to it and sides. And then the, I guess I would call it the front, which is the end that's opposite of where the, the operator would be. You can pull that front panel up. It has two large tires. You can only see one, but we can assume there's two tires. They're, they look like big bike tires. They're pretty good size. And it's got two feet and the feet are on the same, on the end where the, the operator is. And then the handle, instead of two handles that come up loose, like two sticks that are straight or maybe a little bit curved, it's got a big D handle. So it's a large metal handle that comes out. It's kind of shaped like a D or a U, whatever you want to call that. So that gives you the option of gripping it on the sides of the handle or putting your like side to side so your, your forearms are straight and your hands are there. Or you could grip it on the front, the short side of the handle. 
so that your um, the backs of your hands would face up and you'd be gripping it like if you were riding a motorcycle and gripping those handlebars. So that gives you those options there. But it has the two wheels, like I'd mentioned, which gives it a lot more stability. And then the nice thing about that removable front panel, let's say you have that cart and you filled it with um, mulch. You could go out to your flower bed or your garden bed, pull up that back panel and take your trowel and just shovel it uh, shovel the mulch out or you could dump it you could flip it up and dump it you don't have to reach in and scoop it and throw it out it's a lot easier to dispense of what's in there this gray cart that I was just describing it weighs 95 pounds and it can carry up to 400 pounds and before y'all think yay more is more well I want if you're gonna buy something like that whatever cart you were gonna buy I would really recommend that you go to the garden store here in Columbus. I go to Oakland Nursery. Um, there's one right down the street from us. And I would take that out for a test drive. I would grab the card. I would just push it around the store and see how it feels. And then I would put things in it. If I'm likely to be carrying 50 pounds of potting soil or 50 pounds of mulch, I would go find 50 pounds of potting soil or mulch, put it in that cart, and then I would push it around. Can I comfortably push it around? Um, depending on where you are, I'm in central Ohio, it's pretty flat here. We don't have any kind of hills or anything. I've got to go up and down. But depending on where you are in the state, you could be pushing it up hills, pushing it down hills. Think about where you're going to use it, how much it's, how much you're going to put in it and make sure, because this cart, I want to say it's on the handout that I mentioned before, the tools and handout. I think it's around 150 or a few hundred dollars. So to me, that's a huge investment, and I would want to make sure that I could use that thing for the rest of my life. Um, so I definitely, I am skipping all over the place, I apologize. Um, so make sure that, it's, that the weight of it, when it's filled with things, is going to work for you. On the right-hand side, I have a little green wagon. It looks a lot like your little kid's red wagon, except it's made out of more like a nylon fabric, kind of like you'd find on a suitcase. Um, it weighs 21 pounds. The sides can fold down. So that would be really easy to store. Don't know what your storage capacity is. My garage would never hold that big gray wagon, but it could probably hold one of those little green ones. The nice thing about the green wagon, so inside of the, like the bed of the wagon, they've got a pretty good sized plant and a pot, potted plant. Um, it has on both on the, the sides of it, it has pockets like tool pockets. So they've got um, some tools stuffed in there. It looks like maybe some string or twine and some things in there. And then if you can see it, there is, uh, depending on how big your picture is, there is actually a shovel that's um, fit in horizontally. So they put that in, I don't know, from the back and then the handle sticks out. So that probably the pole, the pole of the shovel is on the inside of the cart, but the blade and the handle stick out from either end of the pockets. So those corners are not sewn shut. And then it has four good sturdy plastic wheels that look like good wheels. They're pretty big. And the thing that I like the best about this is it has a long handle like your little red wagon would have. You could probably push it or pull it. And I will tell you in a few minutes why it's so nice to have a handle like that that you can move these things around. Um, like I said, it's 21 pounds. Goodness sakes. Um, 21 pounds, it carries up to 150. So if that's a good option for you, I want to say it's around 100 and 125 something. It's on that handout again, but I really like that one. If I was going to pick a card, it would be that one for me anyway. So for equipment and supply storage, we always have to store everything. You may have a garden shed, you may be storing in your garage, you may be storing in the mudroom or your, who knows, somewhere in your house. Um, store supplies and equipment in or near the garden whenever possible. I recommend using adjustable height shelves to store items and you want to have a shelf at the same height as your garden cart. So on my slide here I have three different pictures. On the far left I have a, um, it's like a very very hard plastic bench. So in this picture the bench seat is up and you can see that it has some um, seat cushions and a big basket or planter empty planter basket and a watering can and some things but if you put that out in your garden those things are all in there so you're not hauling it back and forth from the garage or shed out to the garden and those things i usually see those at target or home depot or lowe's or wherever this time of year they're a real heavy sturdy plastic they look sort of like wood a little bit but um they'd be very good to be out in the elements i've also seen larger um 
I can't think of what they're called, but it's kind of like a locker or like, it looks like just a huge box. The doors will open in the front and it will have shelves inside. And you can often put a padlock on those. So depending on if it's something you need to lock up or not, those are good options. But those, and that, the seat on that bench will let, sit down so you could sit on it when you're not, when you're not getting things near your store. The picture in the middle, I have an old mailbox and it's got a lot of plants growing around it. And the reason I use that is that one of these presentations someone told me that their neighbor put an old mailbox out in the garden and they store little hand things little spray bottles little hand tools in them so that if they want to go out in the garden those little things are out there already they don't have to haul them out if they're walking out to go to their real mailbox on the way back they can stop at the garden and do a little bit of gardening and leave the tools there so I thought that was a really good idea the last picture on my far right is if you've ever come across those metal shelves there's four, five, six shelves. Um, there's four poles, four metal shelves that are open, and those are adjustable. I have, if you were looking in my garage, we have those shelves all around our garage and different. We have four and five shelf sets, and those things are really nice. What I had said before about using adjustable height shelves, if that garden cart, that gray one or the green one, whatever height that is, let's say it's, I don't know, 30 inches off the ground, set a shelf up so it's that height. So that if you had that garden, you had gone to Oakland Nursery or your nursery, come back and put a couple bags of potting soil or something on it. When you want to take it out into the garden to use it, push that cart up to it so that the bed of the cart is even with the shelf. Pull whatever it is you've got on the shelf, whether it's a bin full of gardening tools or mulch or what have you, pull it straight across. You don't have to pick it up and put it in. You're pulling it, which is still an effort, but it's a different effort than lifting and putting in. Um, so if you can line that shelf up, it's easier to push, to pull things in or to push things back on the shelf. Just make it a little easier on you. You also want to keep frequently used items between your knee and your shoulder. Um, the measurements on those are different. I'm five foot ten, so my knees and shoulders are higher than someone who's five feet tall. But keep things within there. That way you're not crouching down so much or lifting up high to get to things and limit overhead storage to lightweight and seldom used items. I always use the example that our Christmas tree and all our Christmas decoration is on the very top shelf in the garage, but it also comes down once a year and then it goes back up once a year. So it doesn't get pulled back and forth very often. It's still awkward and heavy when it does get pulled off, but it's not something we're getting to all the time. And unless you've got really great knees or you don't mind crouching down or kneeling on the floor, be careful what you put down on those lower shelves because inevitably whatever you want is going to roll to the back of the shelf and you have to dig for it. Or maybe that's just my experience. So protecting your fingers, hands, and wrists. Um, don't underestimate how much strain you can put on your hands from gripping something for a long time, whether that's a tool or the spray nozzle on your hose, hand tools, shovels, what have you. But trying to avoid repetitive use, whether that's using a spray bottle or hand pruning, it can, if you can switch hands, do so, but try to limit that because your hands, I know my hands can get really sore if I've overdone something. Um, we want you to keep your hands and wrists in a neutral position instead of twisting. I have a picture on here. It's a person wearing a black glove and their hand is in what we call the neutral position. So the four that's extended out in front of them, the, the thumb is facing the ceiling. So that's just your neutral position. If you think and you put your hands down at your side, most likely they're gonna go like that to where your thumbs face forward or face forward and slightly in. Um, but that's a neutral position. If you can see there is a bend between that person's forearm and their hand. that's not straight across. The forearm does not go straight into the thumb. The thumb naturally has a curve and it's higher. So whenever possible, keep your hands in that position of, instead of twisting, instead of hyperextending your arm to straighten out your forearm and straighten out your thumb, because that can really add a lot of stress to it, or straightening out or twisting your arm, whether that's your, your palm goes up or your palm goes down. Um, that can save you a lot of wear and tear on your arms and your shoulders. I say use grippy gloves to hold tools without exerting your hands and wrists. So in this picture, I'd said that the person's wearing a black glove. It's a black glove and it doesn't have, um, I'm trying to remember, actually this is, I have a version of this grippy glove that does have, on the picture here, they don't have um, 
the, the thumbs and the fingers are bare that's not covered by the glove. I do have a grippy glove that covers the fingers and thumbs. But the way the grippy glove works is you put it on and the palm of the glove is like a textured leather or pleather. It's not smooth, it's got a texture to it. And there is a strap, like another piece of that material that attaches at the base of your wrist, on the inside of your wrist, so at the heel of your hand. And then it's long, so you would put the tool in your hand, you'd be gripping it, and don't grip it tight, just grip it relaxed. Put a, if you can just, I don't have a, I don't have a tool down here. I have a pen. So if that pen was a, was a shovel or a trowel or something, I'm holding it pretty relaxed, if you can, <laughs> I can see that. Um, but I'm not gripping it like I would, but I'm holding it pretty relaxed. If I put that grippy glove on and I wrap it, so I've got the glove in my hand, I'm holding it very loosely, take that strap that would be attached to the inside um, at the base of your hand, pull that up and then it pulls over your hand to your gripped fingers and the strap has Velcro on it. The back of that glove, so the back of your hand has the, I think that's the um, loop side, the soft side of Velcro and that long strap has the hook, the prickly side of Velcro. So you're gripping your tool, you take the strap, you wrap it up around your hand and you secure it to the back of your hand. Now that grippy glove is helping you to hold that tool in your hand. You're not exerting your hand a lot by gripping it tight. You're just kind of a relaxed, comfortable grip, but it'll hold that tool in place because the Velcro is holding your hand shut and the palm of that glove is textured. So it's harder for the tool to pull out, not saying it can't, but it's less likely to. But it's a, if it's something you're gonna be picking up and putting down constantly, that grippy glove is not a good option. But if it's something you're gonna be holding for a while, whether it's a hand trowel or a fork or something, and you have your hands get fatigued, you don't have a good grip strength, you have some arthritis and it's hard to hold things like that, the grippy glove's a really nice option. And it's on the handout. I also say use tools with spring action designed to reduce hand strain. I've seen it called other things and I can't remember what, but it's, let's say you have a little hand pruner. Um, it ha it, however this mechanism works, it doesn't take you very much effort to squeeze that hand pruning. So it's a pretty light action. It's not like, like you have to squeeze it really hard to get a good bite if you're trying to get through a, a thick branch. It's real light and it does the work for you. So that's definitely something I would go to your local garden store if you have one that has these things, hopefully they might have a nice uh, um, adaptive or modified tool section or something for gardeners with arthritis. I also have some, I believe on the handout, I've got a list of, I think like arthritis, it's on arthritis.com. There's a few different companies that specialize in tools for people with arthritis. They're good, worth a look. So we also want you to protect your elbows and shoulders from excessive damage, which is caused by twisting and reaching. So when you think about, I don't have any hanging baskets now, because whenever I put them up, a bird ends up building a nest in them, which is lovely, but not really what I want for my hanging baskets. Um, if you're doing a lot of time reaching over your hands, that can really catch up with you quickly in your shoulders. We have a picture here of a water wand, and it's just a long pole. It's got a black handle with a, um, like a green squeeze grip and that's how you squeeze it or you let it go and that's how you control the flow of water. But it's a long pole and it's telescoping so you can adjust the length of the pole. At the end of the pole is a water nozzle. So you'd attach that to the end of your hose and instead of having to reach out really far or if you've got a really deep bed or you're watering up high, you just hold the water nozzle down at waist or chest high, whatever's comfortable, squeeze it and you're watering your, you're watering your plants. We want you to limit reaching, lifting, and pulling um, using something like the water nozzle. I'll get more into later about changing the infrastructure of your garden, but container gardens, vertical gardens, wall gardens, those are all good options that can help if you have difficulty reaching over your head or it's too hard to bend down or something. Um, using long handled tools can minimize the need to reach or stoop. And again, I'm gonna say stretch. Do a lot of stretching while you're out there working before, during, and after. Try to get some stretching in. Uh, I've got a long handled tool here. So some of the ergonomic advantages. There's a pic, there's two pic, actually three pictures. Picture on the far left, it's called a stout back saver grip. It's on your handout and it's um, a black attachment that you 
attached to say that the handle of a shovel or a rake or a hoe. It has, it looks like an upside down triangle. So across the, the bottom, the, the bottom of the triangle is what you would actually grip with your hand and then it comes down into that triangle shape. And at the bottom, it's got kind of a cuff that you would put the, I don't know what else you would call it, a cuff, but you slide the pole handle through, you secure it, you secure the cuff to the tool, and then you have that inverted triangle. So the pointy side is down and you're gripping the top of it. So the, we have two pictures on here. One is a woman and she is raking something, looks like raking grass or something. And she's all, she's leaning over, she's hunched over. Her left arm is extended and she's twisting her arm and wrist. So her, she's straight from the shoulder all the way down to her hands. It's a straight line, which is not natural. It's, there should be a curve there, but for her to do this work, she has to do that. In her right hand, she's holding it the same way. Her hand is back by her, you can't see it, it's hidden by her torso, but we can assume her hand is back there and she's also holding it in that straight grip. And her back is curved over and she looks uncomfortable. Well, she's smiling, maybe not. Um, but the picture on the right is the picture that we like. She's using the back saver grip, actually probably two of them. She has a back saver grip in the left hand. So she's holding the rake, she's standing up, not totally straight, but her back is not hunched, it's straight. Her head's up and her head's in line with her shoulders and her neck, which keeps you from injuring your shoulders and your neck. She's holding that back saver grip in her left hand. So her hand, the, the back of her hand is facing up towards the sky. And it's got a much, and it's got a curve between the forearm and the hand, which is much more natural and comfortable. You can't really see her right hand, but the expectation is that she should have a back saver grip in that hand so she can hold it the same way. So with long handled tools, the back saver grips are nice, and you can add them onto the tools that you've already got. But if you're going to buy new tools, you want something that's lightweight, that has an enlarged, a foam, or a soft handle, that has a telescoping handle so you could change lengths. If you want to work closer, you want to work longer, it gives you more flexibility. Um, so the shorter length would you allow you to accommodate the task at hand. And then you can add on grips and rubber grips, like I just described that back saver, back, stout back saver grip. Um, so ergonomic tools, when we're talking about ergonomics, we're talking about things that work with the body and that keep you in a natural position. They're designed to keep the body in a neutral position, so they'd be made with large soft handles with a depression or a ridge on the top of the tool to fit your hand. It's curved to match the natural contour of your hand and it keeps your wrist in a neutral position with your thumb on top. So I have two, oh, two groups of pictures here. One of them on my left side is of yellow and green tools. There's a claw, a fork, a little shovel, and then a cuff. And all of them, um, instead of having just the long straight handle that comes out of it, there's a little handle, but then coming up from that handle that comes out from the tool is a green grip so that you're gonna be gripping it instead of holding your, your trowel or your tool with your arm out straight and your hand straightened out from forearm to hand is straight, you can hold it up in a grip and more of a, like a grip, that green one, you still got good leverage. And then the cuff that they show, it has a, it's a yellow and green cuff that'll fit around your forearm and it has a long piece of metal coming out of it. You can't really see it on here, but each of these tools in the back of that yellow handle not with the green one that goes up and down with the back of the yellow handle. There's a little hole where that cuff, the metal rod for the cuff fits in. And it just gives you a little bit more leverage. It's, that gives you more leverage so that you're not using your wrist to keep that straight. The cuff is doing that for you. On my right hand side, I have some green tools. They have curved handles that come around so that you would just, the, the tool comes, then the, the handle comes out of it and then curves down. So you'd just be able to grip it in your hand and maybe put your thumb on top of the longer piece of the handle. So adapted or modified tools, you might already have tools that you like. I have a hand shovel, a hand trowel that I think belonged to my mom or dad, that it's a great tool, has a wood, it has a wood handle, so it's not super comfortable to use. But if I wanna keep using that, and I do, I could do some DIY to it. So um, adapted or modified tool has a long, large, and or foam padded handle, which is easy to manipulate and small and lightweight. Some DIY options, take some pipe insulation. So last summer or two summers ago, I went down the street to Ace Hardware, bought six feet of light pipe insulation for I think $2.50. 
and they have different diameters. I just got the biggest diameter they had available. I cut a section off probably, I don't know, five or six inches and I put it around my tool handle. So I put it around the, the handle of my trowel and then I just secure it with duct tape. So now I've got the same trowel, but I've got a much thicker handle. It's soft, it's foam. So I'm not gripping a hardwood handle, um, which can make my hand, can make your hands just like your knuckles and your joints sore. But if you can't grip that, make a grip like that using those foam handles will help you to still grip the tool and use the tools that you have. Um, or you could, and always secure your DIY upgrades with duct tape. If you wanted to add a long handle on, I have been told that you can add um, PVC pipe. You'd have to get one with the, the inner diameter that's big enough to fit over your tool, duct tape it on there, and you have now made yourself a long handled trowel or a long handled fork. Another thing that's nice that you can do with that foam to upgrade a handle, if you've ever had a five gallon bucket and they come with those wire handles and the little plastic wrap handle that goes around the top of it, that's hard on its own, but inevitably that plastic will break. So you have to cut it off. Otherwise it's just gonna cut into your hand. Take that foam handle and wrap it around either the plastic or just the wire. And it's not gonna make your bucket and its contents any lighter but it's gonna make it a lot easier to, a lot more comfortable to carry so that the metal of the handle is not digging into your hands. We had horses and I would occasionally have to carry a five gallon bucket with water and those things are heavy. And that metal really does dig into your hands. So that's a nice way for $2.47 of pipe insulation and I still have most of it in my garage. That's a good way to upgrade some tools. So to protect your knees and feet, avoid working in awkward positions or standing for long periods of time. And I would say avoid working in awkward positions to protect your whole body, but especially your knees and feet. Um, wearing comfortable and supportive shoes with a good tread will not only give you um, some support because you're standing up on them, but be careful about the type of sole because it could get really slippery. I mean, like I said before, we had a really big storm here, so I'm sure my grass is wet. The steps are probably wet. If I went outside, I'd have to be really careful that I didn't slip on the grass or the steps or the patio or anything. Um, I have a picture here. I have three pictures here. The one on my far left is a work boot. And then it is, it is wrapped up in a, um, it's called an Ergomates, Ergomates sole. It's on the handout, but it has a, a um, the bottom of the, it, it goes around your shoe. The bottom of it, looks like um, those plastic scouring pads that you use for dishes and they're all loopy and twisty and like that's what it is on the bottom. So it gives you a good grip, it's washable. Um, I've heard of dairy farmers that'll use that because you know they might walk around in milk or something else that a cow produces. Um, so you can just hose them off, wash them very e easily. They have some pretty good cushion to them and then those straps just come up so that you can secure it onto the shoes you're wearing. So if you have shoes that you like but maybe they're not they're kind of slippery or they're not soft or supportive enough, these ergo mates are a nice thing to put on top of them. Um, I say sit down and work. If you can sit down and work, that saves your back, it saves your legs and feet, but especially your back from crouching or kneeling, saves your knees. The picture in the center is of a five gallon bucket and it has, it's full of beans and it has a black, instead of the regular lid, it has a black lid that's taller. There's probably several inches. It has legs that come down and it snaps over top of the bucket. Um, I believe this is also on that handout, but it can function as a stool if you want to use it as that. You put that black thing on top of the bucket and then you can put weeds or beans or whatever you're picking or cleaning out of the garden into the bucket. And I've heard people say, I have one of those, I love it. When it fills up with weeds, then I go and I quit. That's my signal to quit. I do not know how I feel about this. I know that I am not always the most coordinated person and I could completely see myself overcompensating and falling off of it. So I think it could be a fine thing if you've got good balance. <laughs> I'm not sure I'd be comfortable personally, but I like the idea that you can sit down and work and you can put things inside your bucket that you're sitting on. Last thing I would say is planting, plant in raised beds or vertical gardens. So if you have trouble getting, if you can't kneel down or you can't easily get down to the ground, I hope that you have not been listening for my secret because I don't have one. I don't know a good way to fix that. 
if you cannot kneel or if you can kneel but you can't get back up I don't have a good solution and I've asked a lot of occupational and physical therapists and they don't really have one they say raise your garden so that's the best thing I can say is raise the garden I have a picture of a raised bed here it's got um, wooden walls around it and it looks like they're planting some lovely tomatoes and some other things inside that and I have more pictures and more information later about um, raised and vertical gardens so next, I want to talk about universal design. It's the creation of products environments meant to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without need for adaptation or specialization. So universal design actually came out of architecture. You might also hear about universal design for learning. We're going to apply universal design to your garden. One of my favorite examples of universal design is um, a ramp that goes into a building. It's there because a person with a wheelchair or other mobility device can't climb stairs so that ramps there but i've also seen people who are using it people who are pushing baby strollers or pulling kids in wagons or people who can't do the stairs for a variety of reasons maybe you had knee surgery maybe you're on crutches um i've seen people delivering dollies full of bottled water or pepsi up in and they use those ramps so the ramp is there for the person who uses a wheelchair or other mobility device but it's useful for everyone or a lot of people at least. So benefits of using universal design in your garden is it makes your garden more user friendly for you, for anybody that comes to visit. Um, it increases the efficiency and ease of use. It provides a safer place to garden because you're limiting barriers, thresholds, um, other things that could be hidden hazards or barriers. It allows you to age in place in the garden. We also talk about aging in place at home. But if you want to stay in your home, we want you to stay there. We want you to stay there safely. And by using universal design, it can make your garden accessible and welcoming to visitors. It makes it accessible and welcoming to you. And I know we probably have at least a very few um, master gardeners in the audience or people who will watch this might be master gardeners. And occasionally you are called upon to put in a new garden. So I've had a couple different extension offices where they're putting a new garden in or they're updating the garden at their county extension office, which is a public office. So then we move over into um, the federal laws that, that govern disability access. So some of the tips I've got coming up next, it doesn't necessarily apply to your home garden, but if you wanna apply it there, please do. But it definitely applies to public spaces or to private spaces that the public will come visit. So for universal design, if you're gonna be putting in walkways or also if you're planning an event, let's say you're planning a farmer's market or some kind of a street fair or a garden tour, think about your walkways. They should be free of barriers, free of debris, that's an easy one, or barriers on the path, okay, above or protruding from the sides. So let's just say that I'm a person who has visual impairment, I have maybe perhaps I'm blind or I have lower vision and I'm walking up your pathway and it's beautiful, it's 36 inches or wider, but you've got hanging baskets all over the place. Like I said, I'm tall, I'm 5'10". Um, if I was a taller person, I could definitely, if I can't see or I can't see well, I could walk into your hanging baskets. So please, if you've got a walkway, make sure if you have hanging baskets, they're high enough so people aren't gonna bash their heads on them. If you have things coming in from the sides, your walkway needs to be at least 36 inches wide, but if you've got planters or I don't know, whoever knows what you want to put on the side of your of your walkway, don't don't encroach on that 36 inches width. It could be 36 inches wide with a couple of 12 inch planters. Now you have reduced the, the width of it. Um, if you have got a walkway and it has a dead end, you need to have at least a 60 inch diameter so someone who's in a wheelchair or a scooter or the mobility device could do a three point turn and turn around. If it's a continuous path, that's not as important, but if you've got something, or even if you have a farmer's market or a farmer's farm stall, make sure that people don't get trapped at the end of a row. They need to turn around or they need to be able to get out of it. If you're putting ramps in for anything, you need to have one inch of rise for every 12 inches of run. That's the safe, that is the mandated you don't want a very very abrupt incline that's not safe and it's also if someone had a manual wheelchair or was using um pushing or pulling something it could be very hard to get up a up a steep incline 
You also want to have no steps, thresholds, or barriers. If you do have those, please put in a ramp or, um, yeah, put in a ramp so that people can get over steps, thresholds, or barriers so they have another way to access that area if you can't put in a ramp. So walkway surfaces and materials should be smooth surface, not slippery. So concrete, asphalt, and other paved surfaces are acceptable. Avoid loose material like sand, gravel, and mulch. And again, I'm saying this for somebody who's working in a public garden, or I mean, absolutely, you could apply this to your own personal home garden, but if you were working in a public garden or a private garden that will be open to the public, these are the things to consider. So you wanna avoid loose materials like sand, gravel, and mulch. Um, and a smooth surface, a firmly packed crusher run 75 and 3 8 inch and under gravel. That will make sense to people who purchase gravel. Um, I don't really know what it means, but if I had to purchase gravel and I told them what I wanted, I'm sure they'd know what I meant. And that includes particles 3 8 an inch in diameter down to fines. That can accommodate wheelchairs and scooters. Again, if you're ordering gravel or something, whoever you're ordering it from would know what that means, I hope. Um, and again, if you're having a uh, garden, open house, open garden event, and you don't want, and it's at your home, and you don't want people using your restroom, which I would feel that way too, or you're having a, per, having a farmer's market, or any kind of an event, you should rent some restrooms, and if you're going to rent some restroom, some bathrooms, rent the um, accessible ones, which is the stall that is large, and it is on ground level. There's no threshold, there's no steps. All kinds of people can use those. Um, if you're holding an event at a public space, it should be at least one accessible stall per bathroom. If you are renting restrooms, rent at least one accessible portable bathroom. If you only rent one bathroom, rent that kind of a stall. And I have two pictures here. One is of a green restroom trailer. Um, it has steps going in it. Those are very nice. They're much nicer than your basic Porter John, but if someone had a wheelchair or couldn't climb the stairs, they'd be out of luck. On the right hand, I have a, a picture of a, of a, it is a Porter John stall, but it's an accessible one. So there are grab bars on the inside of it. Um, there's enough room that you could get your wheelchair and you could maneuver over to the toilet and off. So one more thing, uh, pumpkins, patches, and flower beds. Again, this is for if you're doing a public space or if you have an agritourism, sometimes people will have pumpkin patches or will open their home up for a garden tour. So for a pumpkin patch or another garden with plants that spread like pumpkins, mow vertical and horizontal rows to allow people to access all sides of the patch. I'm not saying that every single row has to be accessible in between it, but if you had a good size pumpkin patch, at least cut it and at least put like kind of a plus sign, a big row down the middle and a big row going the opposite way. So you have a big you know, T or plus in the middle of it so people could get into, get into it from the inside and from the outside. For flower beds and orchards, keep rows between the trees or flowers wide enough for a wheelchair or mobility device to travel 36 inches. Again, especially for a public garden. Um, I don't know how big your garden is at home, but 36 inches in between your flower bed rows is a lot although that would be a great garden, and provide shade. So if you are planning a garden, think of, make sure that you provide shade. I actually was talking to a, I think it was last year, and I'm not gonna say what county it was in, but they were planning a new garden, and it was gonna be like a sensory garden. And so the, the manager was showing me, the, showing me the, the diagram of it, and he said, these are the shady areas. I said, well, where's the person with the wheelchair gonna sit? Well, here, here, well, they're going to sit right next, they can sit next to the bench, but the bench is under the shade, but the wheelchair would not be able to get under the shade, and they might also, I like shade, I'm not in a wheelchair, but I would like to be able to get under that. So think about it when you're putting up shade, make sure that a person in a wheelchair or a couple of people, or if you're not thinking of a wheelchair, a child in a, in a, in a stroller could get under the shade as well as the person sitting on the bench. And I have a picture here of a very nice pumpkin patch. I think that's probably from um, Lynn's far, Lynn Pumpkin Farm, or Lind Orchards over in Pataskala, because I go to that fairly often over the year. Um, some examples and ideas for universal design for visual impairment. You want to clearly define path and garden rows. So in the pictures here, I have um, a couple of pictures. I have one on my left. It's a bench, and it's surrounded by flowers, and they've got pots, and they've got a nice kind of a stone tile floor. The one on the right is actually from the Buxton Inn in Granville, Ohio, 
the path, there's a brick pathway and it's a pink brick path. And then inside the brick path and on the outside the brick path, they have beds. Um, some of the beds are very dark brown, some of the beds are lighter brown, but it still gives enough of a contrast that if I had low vision or some vision, I could tell between the path and the bed so I don't walk into it. So lightly foliaged trees can be used to create light shade. Deep shadows can be confusing as dark patches can look like objects instead of shadows. So that could give you a little bit of a um, difficulty if you're orienting yourself and you're navigating around it. Um, use bright colored or glow in the dark paint or tape on tool handles. I would suggest that for anyone. My little hand trowel that I have is dirt colored. The handle is now dirt colored. I have um, dark gray pipe insulation on it, but I've also wrapped that pipe insulation with red because scarlet and gray is my favorite color combo but it also make the red makes it pop so if I laid it on the ground it wouldn't just blend in with all the dirt. Um, motion sensor lights and well-lit work areas are helpful. Bank up your garden beds so that if you're walking on the path and you weren't looking or you couldn't see it, if you stepped off the path and into the bed, if your foot started to go up the side of a little hill, you'd know I'm walking in the bed so you'd get out of it. So that would not only protect your bed, it would also Give you some orientation of where you are within a garden. No thresholds or barriers. I would say that's helpful for somebody who's using a wheelchair or a scooter or another mobility device as well as somebody who's visually impaired they could stumble over a step or a threshold if they didn't know it was there. And then when you're setting up your garden if you could use landmarks of scent, sound, or touch that can also help to orient the person to where they are within the garden. So we've got some memory or cognitive issues, which I've had these, these questions about this come up quite a few times over the, over the course of doing these presentations. Um, so if someone has cognitive issues or dementia or something else, we don't, it's, it's still important for them to get outside in nature. That can be very helpful with stress, anxiety, keeping up their motor skills, if they can help a little bit with weeding or fog, weeding or watering or tending the plants. The earliest memories we have can be the longest lasting. I like to say that some of my earliest memories are riding a horse. My mom was horse crazy. She had us on horses and ponies probably as soon as we could walk. And those are some of my longest memories, as well as gardening and working. My mother and grandmother and dad were also very, very, um, did a lot of gardening. They were horticulturists. So gardening can help with stress, anxiety, motor skills. Those early memories can be a connection for a person who has memory or cognitive issues that can be very helpful and just very fulfilling and a good way to connect. Um, working in the garden together can build connections between people. And then try to use plants that encourage wildlife such as birds and butterflies because that can also trigger memories, provide visual stimulus, and it's good for the environment. And if you have a garden path, it should as much as possible always return to the house. If, um, if you're designing a path within a garden, avoid abrupt changes and dead ends. Like we said, if a person was, had a memory or a cognitive issue and they got out on the path and it just stopped, they may not be able to process that they need to turn around and go back. It could be very distressing if you got out and you felt like you were trapped. And then for safety's sake, label everything chemicals, tools, equipment, plants, um, at least with what it is. If you have a person in your home who has a cognitive or memory issue and you're afraid that they could go out and access things that are unsafe, lock them up. But label everything also. It's just helpful, especially if someone new comes and doesn't know what's in that chemical spray bottle that has no label on it, um, just to be safe. And I have a picture here of some irises. I wish I could say they're mine, but they're not. I do have a few, but not that many. So some beautiful purpley blue irises. So for universal design tools and equipment, um, lever style door handles are good inside the house, outside the house as gate handles, and also water faucets. If you can get a lever style, um, I should take a picture of the faucet that I have on the side of our building here. It's one of those wheels and I hate that thing um, because if my hands are wet or covered with mud or grass or whatever, it's really hard to grip and turn. If I had arthritis in my hands or had trouble with my grip strength, it would be really, really hard to turn that wheel off and on. So I have four pictures on here. On the bottom right is a picture of a gold spigot 
and it has a lever handle coming up off of it. It kind of, there's a name for those and it's on my handout and I can't remember what it was, like a bib something. Anyway, but it's got just a little bar so you could actually turn that spigot on and off with the heel of your hand or the side of your hand, which is much better than having to grip and turn the wheel. Um, for irrigation, soaker hoses, collapsible hoses and in-ground irrigation systems are terrific. I know in-ground irrigation systems are really expensive. I have three of these collapsible hoses. I need a fourth one. I have a picture on here of a green collapsible hose or a bungee hose. They're super lightweight and they shrink up when they're not full of water, then they expand when they're full of water, but they're so lightweight and they're so easy to use. Love those things. It also has a nice spray gun on it. Um, again, I would suggest if you get one of those, get the kind that you can lock open so that you're not gripping that for a long time. Stools, benches, and rolling work seats are really helpful. I have two pictures of little rolling work seats down here and my far left is a black one. It should be on your handout and it has a cushion seat, it has a backrest, and in that backrest it has, on the outside of it, it has loops like a tool belt, so you could hang your tools in that. It's got a little, on the base of it, it's got kind of a little baskety thing where you could put some things. On the front of it, it has another basket, it has nice big round wheels, and it has a long handle coming out of it that you could push or pull. You can also sit on that, on that little, um, work seat and you can you know shuffle along kind of crab walk and you can use that handle to steer yourself. Now here is the the thing that I'd mentioned before when I think I had mentioned buying seats or whatever it is this very very cute little red work seat here it has a little red tractor seat it's metal it has a little base under the seat um, that you can put some things in it has a basket it has four wheels what it does not have is a handle we, Ohio AgriBuilty, owns this exact little work seat, and it's, it's adorable. I think it's adorable. It looks like the red tractor seat that my dad had on his tractor, and I have this old red, rusty, red, rusty tractor seat from my grandfather's tractor. Same shape. The problem with it is the first time I wanted to use that work seat at the Farm Science Review, I was going to go just across a couple, like a street and a half over, a block and a half over to the Utzinger Memorial Garden, to present on gardening with arthritis. I thought, perfect, I'll take my little work seat with me. I went to push it and thought, okay, I'm gonna have to crouch over it, put my hands on this seat and attempt, attempt to steer it across a block and a half of very busy pedestrian traffic to get it where I want it to go because it has no handle to steer or push or pull. That little red work seat stayed just where it was and then it went over into the, one of the buildings at Farm Science Review and is still there and it's not, much use. And I keep saying I'm going to attach a rope or something to make a handle. I've never done it. But make sure if you get something like that, you have a handle. Unless you're going to always use it exactly where it was, if you want to push it or pull it any distance, you need a longer handle to come up and do that. Learn from my mistakes. Actually, not my mistakes. A coworker bought it, but just the same. Learn from us. So one thing that we can do is container gardening. This can be helpful for if you have a limited space, I live in a condo that has a very small patio. We do, I have a lot of containers around my patio outside with herbs and flowers in them. Um, they're, they're either in a basket or they're like a, a window basket or they're hanging up on the wall around the patio. But if you have, if you can't lean down or bend down or kneel down, if you put it up on the wall, you can still access it. You don't have to abuse your knees while you're doing that. So you can use wood pallet gardens, which is the picture on the far left. It's a wood pallet. It has four rows of onions, parsley, oregano, rosemary, coriander, mint, basil, and thyme. It has a very nice looking wood, uh, wood pallet. It's got black boards. They either paint, paint it or use chalkboard paint on. And then they built a little container so that each of those levels has, it's like a little planter box. It was really cute, but one thing I will tell you when I was looking up wood pallets is a lot of times they are treated with creosote or other chemicals. You don't want to eat anything that comes out of a treated pallet. So you can either set it up like this, build a little, um, build little baskets into it, putting boards on it so it forms little baskets, and then line it with the heavy plastic poly like you'd use over a greenhouse. Or if you could find an insert to go inside of each little um, 
section so that you could plant soil. I also saw, well, you could just build your own pallet. And I thought, well, I guess you could, but that seems like it kind of defeats the whole purpose of using a pallet because you're not really reusing or recycling if you're building your own. I hey, pick Laura. Yes. We are actually on July 16th um, going over container gardening more in depth awesome. with another perfect. speaker for the perfect. Leper Library gardening lessons. Love it. So come back July 16th and you may, Christy, if you think about that, send me the email because I would love to see that. Um, I hope that they talk about shoe organizer gardens. If those shoe bags that you hang over your closet, they have some here and there's 40 something herbs in them. We have a strawberry pot and then we've got a window box, two window boxes with strawberries and flowers in them. So there's a lot of way to do container gardens. Um, we love raised beds. I have two pictures of raised beds. The one on the left is a picture of Jeff. He was on one of our very first slides. He's working with his son. They have a raised garden. Um, Jeff does use a wheelchair so he could sit in the wheelchair and reach over and he could still tend that garden. Raised beds should be two and a half to three feet high with leg room and a depth of two to three feet. So the reason I say leg room is it's something that you want to pull up to so it's kind of shaped like a table or a desk. You would pull up to it if you were using a wheelchair. You could sit at it as if you were sitting at your dining table and you could reach in and you could tend that garden. One thing to think about if you're building or purchasing or setting it up, make sure that you, you can reach either the middle of the bed, if you can access it from both sides, front and back, make sure you can comfortably meet, reach the middle of the bed or if you have it backed up against a wall, make sure you can comfortably reach the back. It's going to be very uncomfortable if you have to bend over it to reach the back while you're tending it. Um, there are different types of beds. There are beds that are standing up like a table like that. They're the kind that are built. There's a wall that raises them off off the ground a few feet or terraced gardens and retaining walls. And I have a picture of a um, raised garden bed that's in one of the box beds. I think that might be from Hardin County actually. And then the next one I have, these are all three from Hardin County. There is a very nice, looks like a block or concrete type of a wall. It's three different levels of a bed. So you could sit on that and you could reach into it and tend it. There's another one that's a really nice one. It's one of the table beds and you can't necessarily tell, but it actually, the trough of it is slanted. It's like a V shape. You could pull up to it from either side. It's over, it's over gravel, so you could access it from the side with the concrete sidewalk or go from the other side. Behind it is a wall, it's poles, and it's got, um, I would call it hog panel, a really heavy wire, and it's got baskets hung over it. So it's vertical, it probably takes up, I don't know how much vertical space, maybe a foot or two of depth, but they have a few dozen baskets on there. So that's really an option if you don't have a lot of ground space or can't get down. And then the third picture is just another picture of that raised garden bed, and you can see the back of that wall of baskets. So when you're planning for next year, I love perennials. Actually, I've got pictures on here. There's my tulips, my grape hyacinths, and um, my Asiatic lilies, which are actually blooming right now, and they're beautiful. I love perennials because they come up. They're really easy to take care of. I like irrigation system or soaker hoses, built-in storage, and inviting neighbors to help you in the garden. So for more information, you can go to agribility. It's A-G-R ability, A-G-R-A-B-I-L-I-T-Y dot O-S-U dot E-D-U slash resources. On that resource page, you'll find links for, I think there's one that I call 2020 webinars. Um, that's where you'll find that garden handout, fitness for farm life, a lot of things like that, things about gardening and farming with a disability. We have 32 fact sheets. We have... Um, the AgStat newsletter that is now coming out a couple times a year. We have different topics. The archives are accessible from the resources page. And then garden ability, which is something that we were planning to do this summer and then, you know, everything happened. But it will be a continuing education opportunity for OSU Extension certified master gardener volunteers. Like I said, we were planning on doing it this spring and summer, but then everything happened. So look for that in 2021. Pam Bennett will be sharing information about that. And that is it. I would say questions, but there's nobody to ask questions. So if you have any questions, if you go to the AgriBuilty site, you can find my email and you can contact me. 
If you have any garden questions, please ask Kristen because I am not a very good gardener. I can tell you all about gardening with a disability, but if you have a gardening or a soil question, I'm not the one. Well, thank you so much, Laura. Thank you. I'm going to...